series and today we are actually talking about traditional knowledge and creativity food cultures and heirloom recipes of the cordillera so who's not interested about food i think all of us would find food a very interesting topic it's one thing that we have every day we look for it whenever we don't have it even when we're having it we're discussing another food that we'll be having at another point during the day so food is really on our mind all the time so for this food culture talastasan uh, period that we're having today we have we are going to have four speakers who will be talking about a coming book sometime this uh, coming year also. So our first panelist for today is Jill Carino, who is currently Executive Director of the Philippine Task Force for Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Vice Chair of Cordillera People's Alliance, an Iboloy activist. She has worked for more than 30 years do researching, organizing, educating, training, and advocating campaigns on IP rights and issues. Ma'am Jill, may I ask you to please pick a seat here right in front. Our second speaker is Judy Carino, who is a graduate of UP Baguio, where she majored in anthropology and sociology. She has been involved in the protection and promotion of indigenous knowledge, and as a musician, composer, researcher, and writer, she has uh, helped promote her advocacies. She is now the editor of the publications of the Partners for Indigenous Knowledge Philippines, or the PIKP. So, Ma'am Judy, may I please ask you to join us right here in front, please? So, the third member of our panel is Ms. Len Regpala. She has a social science background with more than 30 years experience in doing research and development work with indigenous peoples of the Philippines. She is also a trained pranic healer. So, Ma'am Len. And finally, we have Mr. Sixto Talastas, who was born in Lias Barlig Mountain Province, but grew up in Metro Manila, where he studied accountancy at Manuel L. Quezon University. His passion for research in indigenous peoples and culture began in 1998 while researching the Moro for the Alab Katipunan organization. It has led to his work on his home tribe at Lias Barlig. So, Mr. Talastas, may we please ask you to join our panel. So before we start with our discussion for today's uh, food activity, I'd just like to remind everyone that we are actually uh, on live stream. For those people who could not join us today here physically, they are going to listen to us online. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to turn over the control to our panel so they could start discussing our topic for today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this very interesting panel on food. So I will be talking about our project, Keeping Alive the Wisdom of Cordillera Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous knowledge is gaining recognition internationally as a valuable body of knowledge that we all have much to learn from. And uh, for example, the UN, the Convention on Biological Diversity, UNESCO, WIPO, ITBES, and other international bodies recognize the value of traditional knowledge and its potential in addressing the multiple crises that we face in the world today. Sadly, uh, this indigenous wisdom is slowly and in some places rapidly being lost. And in the Cordillera, for instance, many traditional values and practices of the indigenous people are no longer being practiced due to various threats and factors, both internal and external, 
And we may mention here the loss of land and territory, displacement, discrimination, intolerance by organized religion, misappropriation or commercialization, changing values and lack of interest among the youth, elders who are reluctant to transmit their knowledge, uh, urbanization, modern technology, and other factors. Then, so there's also clearly a problem in the effective transmission of this knowledge to the younger generation. In response to the felt need to strengthen and promote indigenous knowledge, the Philippine Task Force for Indigenous Peoples' Rights, or TFIP, and the Partners for Indigenous Knowledge Philippines, or PIKP, together started a project entitled Keeping Alive the Wisdom of Cordillera Indigenous Peoples. This project is supported by VOICE, uh, an in innovative grant facility of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which supports the most marginalized and discriminated people to amplify and connect their unheard voices. Just to give a short background, TFIP is a network of 11 NGOs that has had rich experience in conducting community-based participatory action research, training, and advocacy campaigns on indigenous people's rights, issues, and concerns. While PIKP is a broad network of individual knowledge holders, researchers, experts, and advocates who have been doing their own initiatives to promote indigenous knowledge over the past several years. Together, we aim to enable indigenous elders, women and youth in the Cordillera to contribute their knowledge towards culture-rooted indigenous peoples' education in schools and communities. And we seek to foster participatory and community-based learning through storytelling, learning exchanges, coming up with education materials that are creative, useful, and easily understood and readily accessible to indigenous communities, organizations, and schools, as well as to the wider public. We need to teach this valuable indigenous knowledge to the younger generation through creative and accurate education material about indigenous peoples. Fortunately, uh, recent education policies in the Philippines have opened up new opportunities for teaching indigenous knowledge in the schools. Uh, for example, Department, education Order, Department of Education Order 62 in 2011 recognizes the right of indigenous peoples to culture-rooted education. And the Enhanced Basic uh, Education Act, or K-12 law, promotes education that is inclusive, culture-sensitive, and flexible enough to allow localization and indigenization of learning. Given this favorable policy context, it is necessary to maximize these newly opened spaces for indigenous learning. We need to innovate by linking up indigenous knowledge holders with educators, researchers, artists, writers, and learning institutions to keep alive the indigenous wisdom of our community elders. And it is also important to correct misconceptions and discriminatory attitudes towards indigenous peoples that are being spread via uh, textbooks and incorrect uh, education material. We need to develop greater appreciation for indigenous knowledge as a guide in our daily lives worthy of emulation by all of us. Particularly for the youth, we need to develop creative forms that can catch their interest uh, and uh, forms of communication and activities that will inspire them to learn and promote indigenous wisdom. And to be able to catch their interest, we need to strike at issues that are close to their hearts, their minds, and their stomachs, yung which they feel every day, and which brings us now to the topic of food. And uh, one of the several outputs of this project is a recipe book of heirloom recipes of the Cordillera. We traveled to different provinces in the region, conducting food workshops and exchanges with local women and community organizations who are knowledgeable about cooking traditional food. The book will feature indigenous recipes on food preparation, accompanied by stories about their importance and value for indigenous peoples. So this panel is a sneak peek into the book, Heirloom Recipes of the Cordillera, 
which will be coming out in March next year. So through, through this project, we hope to promote a greater appreciation of Cordillera traditional food and teach us how to cook it. So I invite you all to learn more and have a taste of the traditional food of the Cordillera indigenous peoples. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome, and later we're going to let you have a taste of the food that we are going to talk about. <laughs> it's outside kasi bawal da ang food dito sa <laughs> Yeah. So uh, let me start by talking a little about traditional knowledge. Just a few slides. So traditional knowledge is the knowledge, innovations, and practices of local and indigenous communities around the world. So this is a product of thousands of years of collective creativity and innovation by indigenous communities. And it is adapted to the local culture and environment, passed orally from generation to generation, and it is collectively owned. And it is a gift of the previous generations and the birthright of future generations. Kaya ito yung advocacy namin that this birthright should continue and it should not be in our generation that this is lost. So what, what is included in traditional knowledge? Everything, values, language, crafts, agricultural practices, etc. especially uh, the traditional food. And so this is what we are going to talk about today. Uh, value, Jill's already served, uh, talked about it, so let's go straight to the traditional food of the Cordillera. Uh, I have a question. Are the people of the Cordillera carnivorous? What do you think? Yes or no? <laughs> huh? Both, yeah. <laughs> Actually, many believe that the people of the Cordillera are carnivorous because um, very often, our exposure to traditional food is during traditional feasts, weddings, rituals, where meat, lots of meat, is the main dish. Uh, this food is uh, served in the Ibaloy Day every year at the Ibaloy Heritage Park in Burnham. So in the left, you would see the wat-wat, which is simply boiled meat with rice, of course, and then we have the dumshang or the uh, roasted skin <laughs> and meat. <laughs> yeah. And usually they also serve the pinunag or the blood sausages. So this is the common, uh, the fair, the ritual fair of the Ibaloy people. So if that's what you own, if that's only what you attend, you would think that the Ibaloys are carnivorous. And these uh, foods are very simply prepared, just boiled, just roasted, ganon. But what makes it extra special is the community, the ritual, and the sharing that what what is part of. And of course, the pig is freshly butchered, which makes the meat extra delicious. Yeah. But is meat the main component of the traditional diet? No, it is not. Because for the rest of the days, outside of community feasts and special occasions, the food served depends on what is available in the fields, backyard, forest, and waters. So the traditional diet is as diverse as the biodiversity in the homeland. Rice is the staple, supplemented by root crops. For many Cordillera communities, Rice is planted once, maybe twice, in the narrow rice fields. And so, rice is limited, and the harvest has to be stretched out to feed the family for the whole year. Because rice is so valuable, children are taught not to raise, waste a single grain, and they are told that the rice cries when it is wasted. We gathered many recipes for rice. 
Many of these dishes have camote or banana or gabi added to the rice to stretch the rice supply. And for special occasions, each community has their own way of cooking rice, like linapet, the one down there of Basau, which is ground rice with peanuts wrapped in banana leaves and steamed. And in Kalinga, there is inandila, which is a very complicated process pala kasi it is ground sticky rice shaped in tongues, wrapped, first wrapped and steamed. They choose certain leaves to wrap it in, and then it is unwrapped <laughs> and served with coconut latik or laduk, what they call. And in Ifugao, there is binakle, which is a combination of sticky rice and kamote. So in each community, you would find their own way of cooking their special rice delicacy. Yeah. So what is eaten with the rice? Actually, the traditional diet is high in vegetables, but not vegetarian naman. <laughs> in Kalinga, Binongor gathers together in one dish all of these all of these uh, ingredients and more, banana heart, langka, squash beans, mushrooms, edible shells, and snails from the river or the rice fields cooked with lots of sili. And sili is said to preserve this dish and it lasts for a, for a week or more. So the one who taught us how to cook this dish is a student from Benguet State University who stays in the dorm and what they do is they cook a big pot of binongor, maybe on Sunday, <laughs> which lasts them the whole week. <laughs> and then uh, as the week goes on, it becomes more and more spicy. And uh, it lasts, it doesn't get gone. So this is the parang chapsoy ng kalinga. Yeah. Um, other veggies, uh, the gabi plant is widely cooked all over the cordillera using all its parts from the root, stalk, and leaves making up the dish. There are tips from many cooks on how to avoid producing an itchy dish, like letting it boil without disturbing it, and then when it has gone down, just to turn it upside down. Yeah, yes. <laughs> do, not, do not keep on stirring it. <laughs> or not washing the gabi if it comes from their garden, and merely wiping it, wiping it with the outer skin of the stock so they don't wash it. And of course, choosing the right variety of gabi. And many greens are used like camote tops, sayote shoots, amti, tongsoy or watercress, and masaplora shoots. Our informants from Sadanga said that a simple diet of rice with greens with occasional meat is the reason for many of their elders living until they reach 100 years old. Another favorite dish all over the Cordillera is boiled pulses or dried beans, which are boiled along with small pieces of smoked meats. And from the waters of the rice fields, creeks, and rivers are gathered edible snails, round ones and long ones, insects, water plants, small and big fish, crabs, and shrimps. Yeah, so that snail is the one they use for binongor, the long one. And then shrimps, and then small fish called gadiu. And these are the eggs of the ants, abuus, which is cooked, which is eaten all over the Cordillera. It's a no creamy and <laughs> Tastes like a no guyabano to me. <laughs> yeah. Again, these are simply cooked, boiled in a little water, sometimes with coconut cream or roasted, allowing the natural flavors to shine and are never covered with rich sauces. And of course, there are many recipes for food preservations, which have been developed to cope with hard times and to show and shows the resilience of the Cordillera people. So here, I will show you the tangba. This is, I'll talk about it later, and then the wine and the utag, the famous utag of Sagada. When meat is plentiful or when one attends a community feast 
and is given what what or a share of the meat, this is simply salted and hung above the cooking fire in the traditional kitchen to be used in the future to flavor a pot of pinipikan chicken soup or a pot of boiled pulses, such as black beans, white beans, or mongo. In Ifugao, the meat is chopped finely, salted, and made into sausages, which are smoked, called pinunog. Later on, I will share with you the recipe, and I'll let you taste it outside. <laughs> pinunog. And tungba, this one on the left, is a preserved gravy or sauce in Basau Mountain Province made out of small river crabs, pounded rice, and salt. This is placed in a jar left to ferment for several months. When there is no other food, this can serve as the viand. Also, it is served to new mothers and is said to help them produce enough milk to nurse their infants. And wines are produced from rice, from sugar cane, from kamoteng kahoy, usually served during special occasions. For the Cordillera people, food is a gift of the land and something to be thankful for. It is a gift that is to be shared with family, community, and with the unseen from whom these blessings come. Thus, it is never to be wasted, but always to be valued and shared. Food is the everyday expression of the deep relationship with the land, being rooted in the land, which is the source of food and of life. Thus, planting and harvest seasons are marked with holidays and community feasts where the animals are butchered and meat is shared with all. The belongingness to community is manifested in the preparation of food. It takes a village of women to prepare the inandila in Kalinga for community feasts, from the pounding of the rice, mixing, forming, and wrapping, steaming, and wrapping, and cooking the coconut into the laduk until the delicacy is ready to be served. And in the traditional kitchen, the cooking is mindful. There is a food ethic that values the nutrients in the food and makes sure that nothing is wasted and that food is healthy and clean, good enough for serving and sharing and to be offered to the unseen spirits and the dear departed ancestors. All these heirloom recipes that we have gathered are products of the creativity and innovation of generations of women and men who, working with simple ingredients, simple cooking implements, are able to produce delicious and healthy meals for their families, communities, and visitors, and not to forget the unseen spirits who accompany the people in their daily lives. Thank you very much. We're going now to show some recipes before the other two panelists will speak. So, good morning again. Uh, I'm going to share a recipe from uh, Apayao. It's called Ginunob, yeah. Um, so this is the ingredients: um, salt, coconut oil, and banana leaf. Okay. So what's the procedure? We dampen salt with water, wrap the salt in four layers of banana leaf. Um, we build a fire and put burning char charcoal on top of the wrapped salt. We wait until the wrapper is burned. We remove the salt from the fire and unwrap it, the salt, and then we dip hot, the hot salt in a cup of coconut oil. We have this, you are going to taste this. It's very simple. It is eaten during harvest time. So you can imagine that uh, salt is eaten with newly harvested rice. So um, it's a very simple dish, but uh, when you eat it with newly cooked rice, it is delicious. For me, when we were um, having the workshop with our snug um, people, this was one of my favorites because it's very simple. Ayan, 
I'm going to present one of the recipes from Abra. Uh, they called it uh, dinokdok, or meaning you you pound it after it is cooked. So the ingredients are one kilo of sticky rice or the decut, one bunch of ripe bananas, especially uh, the variety of the pig, uh, peeled and cut into bite sizes and water for cooking. Um, procedures, mix sticky rice and bananas in a pot. Add enough water to cook the rice, put over the fire and let it boil. U usually the cooking procedure is like when you are cooking rice, so that's it. Uh, it's, it's just with banana. And then remove from fire, then use a wooden stick with three points, pahiram ng din, pang dok dok nila. <laughs> this is what they use during our food workshop in Abra. So they just like this. <laughs> and uh, until the I, sugar and salt is optional. So the sample outside, we, the, we didn't put uh, sugar or salt. So it's up to you if you, you are going to use the ginunub. So. Uh, they usually serve this uh, every morning, or when they are, or when they are in the fields as snacks also. So this is the dinok dok of Abra. Thank you. Hi, good morning to everyone. Uh, the supu soup from Benguet. Uh, the ingredients are one kilo cassava, half kilo sugar, boiling water, steam pot, uh, steamer, clean sardines or container, clean piece of cloth for squeeze, and then lard. That's your, and then procedure, wash the cassava, grate the cassava, squeeze it until you remove a white liquid because there's a liquid of the cassava. Mix it well with sugar or grated coconut. Put it in a clean sardine container like this. <laughs> container with a lard uh, around it here. And cook in boiling water for 30 minutes. And serve it hot or cold. This procedure, uh, supposed to uh, were usually uh, do an, uh, during herb, I know. <laughs> during, uh, what do you call it? Uh, ano na? <laughs> uh, op optional sa mga ano, sa mga walang bigas. Yun lang po. Uh, alternative source of rice. Uh, itong pinunog naman is the sausage of Ifugao. Ingredients. Ay, bakit wala? Yun pala. Ingredients. One long piece of pork, large intestine, cleaned. Uh, they use salt to wash it and clean it until everything is clean. Then one and one half kilo pork meat with fat finely chopped. One half cup salt and one fourth cup minced garlic, which is optional. Procedure, mix the pork with the salt and garlic. Use a funnel and push the meat mixture into the pork intestine, not the filled intestine at both ends, and form it into a spiral. Place flat in the bigao, or a flat basket, and smoke the sausage over the fireplace for at least one week. The longer it is kept, the stronger the taste. To cook, cut into desired sizes, boil in a little water, and when dry, add a little oil and fry. So that's it. So the next recipe is bingao from Kalinga. And this is a soup. So you get one chupa of mungo, milk from one coconut, one teaspoon of salt, and five cups of water. First, roast the mungo until such time that when it's beaten, it will break. So it's a bit crispy. 
and uh, after that you pound it and uh, remove the peelings from the mungo uh, using a winnow basket to uh, remove the s skin. And then uh, put the mungo in a pot with two liters of water for a soupy dish and bring to a boil cooking until it is soft. Add water uh, to have enough soup. So if it uh, dries up, you have to add more water until it's a soupy consistency. And then place in the coconut cream and bring it to a boil and add salt to taste and turn off the heat. So uh, we cooked this this morning, and we will also be letting you taste this later on. Thank you. Uh, in the baan, the w the letter is the uh, is V letter V. In the baan, the pronunciation nila from Sadanga Mountain Province. So the, uh, nakakita na ba kayo ng ulam na kanin? Ito ang ulam na kanin. Ingredients, one cup rice, water, two cups of vegetables. Ang vegetables, um, tea, pwedeng latong or leaves. Yung latong the shoot of black beans. Young stalks and leaves of gabi sprouted after breaking of the big stalks. A pop oak or ginde grows along the sides of the rice paddy. So, ayan ang mga alternative sa amti. But uh, yung na-prepare ngayon is amti. Mamaya matitikman ninyo. So, the ingredients are one cup rice, water, two cups of vegetables, or two cups of amti, or one bundle of amti. Put rice in a pot and add enough water to cook rice into a porridge or like a soup. Put pot over the stove, bring to a boil, then cook over low fire for around 20 minutes until rice is cooked or until rice becomes par porridge. Add vegetable or five minutes before fully, fully becoming a porridge. Uh, add vegetables to the cooked rice porridge. Add salt and cook for three to five minutes more, and serve hot. Ayan po. Uh, my topic is uh, learnings as a researcher on <coughs> Cordillera heirloom foods. Mm, maraming interesting na natutunan ako sa research na ito. <laughs> Ma, yung pagiging cheap or, or Yung iba, free, free ingredients. Or kung mabibili mo man ay cheap, very cheap. Tapos, yung pagiging healthy niya. Alam natin na uh, very healthy ito, pero hindi siguro natin al alam kung bakit. Yan. Cheap siya or free kasi yung mga pinuntahan naming community, yung mga ingredients nila ay galing sa kanilang mga bakuran from their farms, from their gardens, from the rivers, streams, brooks, creeks, from the forest. So, meron mga silang mga nabili, it's very cheap kasi dun mil mismo, mismo nila nabili sa mga kapitbahay nila, sa community nila. You know. Yung mga plants, uh, usually ano, may mga na itatanim, mayroong hindi na itatanim. Katulad nung gabi, na itatanim yan pero tumutubo rin siya sa, ano, sa mga gilid-gilid ng mga rice paddies, sa mga uma. 
Yung mga ibang hindi na itatanim is uh, tungsoy, uh, masaflora, sayote, uh, amti, ano pa ba? Pako. So, pakpako sa iba. Fern. Tapos, may isang naamis ako sa apayaw. May present silang giant fern. Laki-laki. Finger size na fern. Na masarap. Tapos, healthy po na tayo sa pagiging healthy. Healthy siya kasi unang-una, mm, hindi siya ginagamitan o traditionally, hindi siya ginagamitan ng mga uh, crops with GMOs o yung mga animals na hybrid. Although ngayon, uh, siyempre dahil tumami na yung mga plants na may GMO, hindi na maiwasan. So may, may mga food masters na na-interview kami na sabi nila ay uh, nagtatanim na sila ng rice na hybrid kailangan para para lang makapag-produce ng marami. Kasi yung yung native variety daw ng mga rice nila ay uh, uh, one cropping lang. Ganun. Tapos sa corn, uh, yung isang food master sa Kalinga sabi niya, ang corn nila ay hindi niya sigurado kung native o ito yung hybrid. So ganun. Mamaya pag-usapan natin yung mga threats sa itong mga traditional heirloom food. Tapos healthy siya dahil yung production ng mga ingredients, production ng mga plants and animals is uh, labor, laborious. Uh, you need to exert physical uh, power. So, nakakapag-exercise sila na nagiging o oh, nailalabas nila yung lingit nila. So, healthy siya, healthy activity para sa katawan. Tapos, simple. Simple mga ingredients. Katulad namang na-present kanina, walang mga additives na chemicals. Walang mga betchin o ano-ano pa. Walang processed food. Walang mga uh, ano pa ba yung mga additives na hindi lang ano eh hindi lang bitchin marami pang iba klase no? na hinahalo ngayon so ayun ngayon punta tayo sa mga threats halimbawa sa mga organic uh, na ingredients ang mga threats diyan is yung ayung propagation ng GMO uh, plants with GMOs propagation ng hybrid animals so tapos yung influx ng mga easy to cook na pagkain sa market tapos uh, nakakatulong mga advertisement sa TV social media ina-advertise yung mga it, itong mga pagkain na easy to cook mga fast food mga additives na chemicals yon So, isang malaking threat dito yung market economy kasi ayun nga, nag encourage ng uh, bumili ng mga ganong bagay. Tapos isa yung nawawala rin yung, yung traditional uh, system ng community sharing dahil sa market economy. So, ini-encourage ng economy na mag business ang bawat isa, ibenta mo yung mga plants or animals. Unlike before, uh, for example, yung isang food master sa Dalupirip, sa Itogon, uh, dati sabi niya, nakakakuha kami ng pakpako, tungsoy sa, sa rice paddy o umanang 
kapitbahay nila kasi malapit lang sa bahay nila. Pero later on, ipinagbawal ng kapitbahay nila dahil ibebenta daw niya. E usually sa ganin, ganung tradisyon nila is dati daw nagbibigayan sila. Kung katulad ng tungsoy, kasi hindi naman tinatanim ang tungsoy. So usually, pag uh, kukuha ka, magpapaalam ka lang, bibigyan ka. Pero ngayon na daw, hindi na sila pinapayagan. Dahil ibebenta daw. Yan. So yung tradisyon ng sharing, ng kung anong meron ka, isi-share mo sa uh, community mo, nawawala. Dahil sa ganon. Tapos, may mga isang anecdote din ako natutunan. Yung sa anti na i-present kanina, sabi ng isang uh, food master sa Ifugao, anti daw is uh, hindi nakaka hindi nawawala ang hindi nawawala ang panlasa kung ikaw ay may sakit. Minsan pag may sakit ka, nawawala yung panlasa mo sa ibang mga food hindi mo malalasahan. Pero sa amti, kahit may sakit ka, malalasahan mo pa rin ang amti. Ayun, yung isang ano doon. Tapos, ayun sa cooking implements, ayun yan, uh, may banga. Actually, ano, uh, hindi namin nakuha yung iba kasi yung iba mahirap ibiyahe, tapos yung iba, sabi nila, ibibigay nila, nakalimutan nilang ibigay. So marami pang mga indigenous cooking materials, cooking implements na nagamit, pero hindi na amin na dala lahat. So dyan, merong from Abra, from Apayaw, from Kalinga, may banga, may kawayan o bambu na ginawang cup, bambu tube na pinaglutuan, may bambu tube na pinag-istiman. Ayun. Hindi, ipakita ko lang na. Bakit, sabi nila, bakit, bakit hindi banana leaves? Sabi nila is, 
uh, may kakaibang lasa ang bunny leaves na hindi kakaiba sa banana leaves. Kaya ayun ang ginagamit nila. Parehas nito na natuyot na kaya lumiit. Nung ginamit ito, medyo malaki pa ito. Ito, pag ilalagay yung yung pagkain dito, alam ba yung, yung rice wrap in bunny leaves, ilalagay dito, ito yung pang pang sudsud o pang tulak sa loob. Tapos, uh, may, meron din ganito na pang hindi nila naibigay yung isang bamboo tube na medyo mas maliit kesa dito. Uh, bunny stick din yung pang bayo ng sili. So sabi nyo, bakit? Bakit kailangan ng bunny? Kasi nga, may may certain juice or siguro na kumakapit sa food. So malalasahan mo rin daw yung taste ng bunny. Yung bunny stem. Ganun. So, ayan. Tapos sa uh, ingredients, may mga ingredients na uh, magkakapareho ang pangalan sa so, from province to province, from tribe to tribe to tribe. May mga food na magkakapareho ang pangalan from tribe to tribe. Uh, yung iba, may may ingredients na tag dito uh, magkakaiba ang pangalan pero uh, the same use ba pareho ang gamit ayun at uh, siguro ano yun yun lang ang uh, may bahagi ko sa aking learnings. Marami pa, pero siguro kulang tayo sa time eh. So, yun lang. Salamat. While we're fixing the PowerPoint, uh, yung next part po ng ating presentation, which is the last part, is actually um, sharing our experience on the innovations on the transmission of indigenous knowledge, yung buha experience. Kasi this uh, first part is actually about food. The second part is about stories. So um, we share to you yung story of our partnership between the Partners for Indigenous Knowledge, Philippine Task Force Indigenous Peoples' Rights, and the Pakalso National High School. So the aim was to produce a resource book for contextualized IP education for schools. So our main way of transmission of knowledge and in the content of the book is storytelling and writing as a way to transmit indigenous knowledge and values. So the transmission is between groups and peoples in the communities and also between communities and also this is more of what we know intergeneration transfer of knowledge but a lot of transfer of knowledge is being done in a community in the same way that we are doing it now so the first in the process that was that we had a memorandum of agreement signing with the school and we involved the school, the teachers and the students. So um, the community was also involved through the elders and knowledge holders and the local government unit through the indigenous people's um, mandatory representative. Um, we also had community learning exchange on research, documentation and story writing, storytelling. So the elders also performed a ritual which the teachers documented. So this is the uh, in-service training on research and documentation and story writing. 
um, aside from this, we also had an indigenous story writing contest for students where elders share their stories, students and youth document the stories. Uh, we also had a write shop for teachers and students. So um, this is how we tried to um, connect the elders and the students and also the community. Um, so this is a picture of the Indigenous Story uh, Writing Contest in Pakalso National High School. Um, there was an event that uh, challenged the people and the school, and that was Typhoon Ompong. Do we remember Typhoon Ompong? Yes. So, um, but also, this challenging event um, gave rise to many practices or revived cultural practices and values. Yes, it is a tragedy, but also it brought forth certain good values, and these are some of them. So individual, individual initiatives to help people who were effect affected by the typhoon. Different forms of cooperation um, came up, uh, people helping in, uh, each other, um, carrying um, things, needed by the uh, people rescuing, uh, group, group um, cooking for those who were also retrieving um, the survivors or uh, the dead from the affected areas. We also saw the importance of the cleansing ritual and the bunong prayer with offerings, uh, meaning um, pigs being offered for community well-being. So these are the, um, the, we had a lot of stories related to this. So we are documenting uh, this at present. So again, um, this storytelling, story writing is the innovation of the project in relation to knowledge, indigenous knowledge transmission. And it is an ongoing process. We invite you to try this innovation or this technique so that somehow indigenous knowledge will be transmitted, shared, and made vis visible to many of us, especially for the students. With this, I thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Jill, Judy, Len, and Sir Sixto. So all this information that they provided us today was one neat package, so again, related to food, packaged food. But it's not just all about eating. The way that they gave it to us was, here, you can try this food, take a look at it. We've put it in a book, and what is this for? It's for us to spread our culture, for us to perpetuate traditional methods of preparing food for everybody to know what it is. So thank you for sharing that with us today. And this time, I would like to call on the former Dean of the College of Arts and Communication, Mom Candy Torres, to provide us with a more wrapped up version of what has transpired for the last hour.
like something, uh, some clarifications or questions for our panelists. Uh, good morning. I'm from I'm Christopher from Bayambang Pangasinan. I just I arrived a little bit uh, around 50, 20 minutes after the first set of le lectures have started. Uh, I just want to know um, <coughs> from the point of view of food um, food scholarship, uh any term to refer to because here in the Cordilleras you, you refer to your uh, traditions food traditions as indigenous um, heritage food or uh, indigenous culinary traditions. In the sa amin, sa baba, uh, what's the right term to refer to our food traditions? Is it uh, local food or uh, can we also use the term heritage? Because in, in, in Central Pangasinan, we're doing our, in my ta hometown, where I'm initiating a culture mapping project in cooperation with the, our LGU. Uh, our the Adept Ed and the Center for Pangasinan Studies, and we isa sa mga minam minam na map na namin yung nasimula na namin mamap yung uh, yung mga uh, her, uh, culinary traditions sa sa lugar namin. And ang pinaka malakas na food tradition namin yung pagbuburo o yung pagferment ng rice and uh, freshwater fish. Buro yung term na ginagamit namin. So, ano yung tamang term to refer to our ano yung tradition, yung food tradition, is it indigenous food tradition or local culinary traditions? Uh, and secondly, meron ba kayong tradition ng pagbuburo dito sa sa inyo sa Cordillera region? Pagbuburo ng mga isda or mga meat? Kasi I came in late, so I had no. Uh, 